I'm joined today by the Honourable Member of Oxley, Melinda Pavey. Welcome to Backchat, Melinda. Thank you, Rod. Pleasure to be here at the Youth Hub in Bella. At the Youth Hub in Bellingen, yes. Um, was, was that part of your role when you, you got involved in politics? So that was probably before you came on board? I, think. Uh, I remember when it was uh, the funding came through. I think uh, Luke Hudson had something to do with some of that money. And, okay. well, and, and the people of Bella fought for it really hard. And I, I was probably living um, at Coffs and in the upper house at that point. You were elected in 2015 to the seat of Oxley. Uh, you've become Minister for Roads, Maritime and Freight in 2017. Does it feel like you've become an overnight success? Absolutely not. <laughs> I've been around politics now for a very long time um, and it's a, it's a hard gig. Uh, so I was in the upper house, which gave me a lot of experience and there's some really great people here in the Shire that said, you know, that mightn't have been my way inclined politically, but they said, no, give her a go because at least we've got someone that's experienced at politics. I wasn't going into politics going, oh, my gosh, this is exciting and the shiny lights. I know that there's not a lot of shining lights um, and there's a lot of hard work and there's a lot of connections and contacts and being in government, knowing who heads the bureaucracies, knowing who to go to in ministerial offices is really important to delivery. Um, and I think having my predecessor, Andrew Stoner, as the Deputy Premier and now myself, an experienced um, parliamentary operator has been good not just for the Bellow Shire but for the other uh, three shires that actually are in the Oxley electorate. Right well and, and talking about going to um, Parliament House down in down in Sydney um, what's that like when you turn up there you know your first time you're in question time um, we see it on TV um, but what's it like you know behind the scenes being involved? Uh, so what is it like down there? I have good relationships with, uh, with people across all sides of politics because I look at people in their eyes and, you know, if I've got a connection, I always want to see a connection. I want to be able to connect with people and understand their perspective on things uh, and that's important. So I do, I play netball um, occasionally with some of uh, the Labor members of Parliament, a Green member of Parliament. It can be a tough and, and cruel game and I've I I was probably very naive to that for a lot of years um, and then you you face a you know a difficult patch um, it, it enables you to reassess and actually understand some of the games that I probably wasn't too aware of earlier mm. Mm. is there tactics when you go into question time that you know you all get together before that starts and we've got a game plan and you take on this guy and I'll take on this guy or there's good cop bad cop is is it, is it almost a little bit staged, the, you know, the way that pans out? No, it's not. We would certainly, as a minister, you work with your own team, your own ministerial office, and you might be given a question um, by the leadership team and you then work out uh, what you might want to address in that question, a theme of that question. The leadership team, which would include the Premier, the Deputy Premier and the leaders of the Upper House and the Leader of the House, they probably deal more with those tactics uh, and I'm not there when those tactics are decided or, or organised. But depending on how well you go in, in question time depends on how many questions you get. And I've got a reasonable voice for, shall I say, I'm going to say for a female because often you'll hear criticism of women uh, in the chamber um, and when everyone's being noisy, you know, we can tend to, to speak high and some, t and I've, I've had people say, you, you know, my voice can carry, but I can also go high when it's getting, you know, very mm. confrontational and noisy and, you know, you want to make your point, you've got to raise your voice, but that's a challenge and that's something I've been working on to keep that voice down. Is it, is it challenging for you with, um, with male people within parliament? Because sometimes, uh you know, the male person doesn't always like the the, um, the strong voice coming from a female. Really, Rod? <laughs> it has been a challenge throughout my career, mm. um, not just on the floor of the chamber, um, but it is important that we get strong, uh, feisty, um, mm. intelligent, hardworking men and women into the parliament uh, and I've, I'm certainly proud of the part I've played. I know there are two female colleagues of mine that I've been able to encourage into politics and who've 
made it into parliament and i think we do add a nice balance yeah and during question time when things get heated and, and at lunchtime we all go off to the cafeteria together um, do you almost have a go at somebody in question time and then slap them on the back in the cafeteria and go, you know, wasn't that funny what I said and things like that? And yeah, there, there can be a bit of that. I, I mean, just in terms of context, lunch, then question time, then we might go and have a coffee for right. afternoon tea. Um, and, yeah, I there, there can be uh, a bit of that good humour um, yeah, that great Australian, you know, self-deprecation mm -hmm. um, goes on between each other. And, yeah, if you get one up on one of them, it, it can be a, a good thing to, to be part of. And I think, you know, being, I mean, people don't really understand this because we don't explain it well, but 80% of legislation goes through the parliament with everyone agreeing. It's only rare that you have conflict and major policy debates and and major policy debates are often conscience or free votes where it's not up to a party room decide it's up to a member's conscience to decide on on personal or religious issues so mm. they're probably the best moments in the parliament mm. now you live in Yurunga. Mm -hmm. your office is in west kempsey that's right please explain well i know bellow loves bellow and that there's no other part of the world except Bellow. But the Oxley electorate is actually a huge area encompassing four valleys. So it's not just uh, the it's not just Bellinger Valley, it's also the Nambucca Valley, it's the Maclay Valley, and it's also part of the Hastings Valley. So I go up to Warhope and Convoy, out to Dorigo, of course. So Dorigo and Convoy are like brother and sister. And then you've got Bellingen and Warhope. There's a lot of similarities between these two, those two communities as well, because you've got them, they were the original timber towns and, and Warhope was the capital and, and Port Macquarie was the fishing village. Now that's reversed. Um, and Bellingen, uh, well, Dorigo was actually the capital of the Shire and Coffs Harbour was the fishing village many years ago. So the... Kempsey is the largest um, town in the Shire. It was where the previous member's electorate office was um, and it's probably between Maxwell and Kempsey is the, the middle distance. So mm. in terms of saving money for the taxpayer, we left it in Kempsey. Now, what do you think are the major issues in a rural area like Oxley that um, we you know, need, need to deal with in the future? I think jobs. I think it really comes back to ensuring that we have opportunities uh, for people to live and work here. Uh, now, whether people think that a particular area might be full, and I understand that Bellingen, you know, might think that, we, that we've got enough, but I know in other areas like Nambaka and Maxwell um, and Kempsey, there's really great potential in terms of housing affordability, lifestyle. We've got universities on our doorsteps. We've got great hospitals, uh, good schools, that there is more of an opportunity to to give people the um, to move into a regional area. I just think living in a regional area like Kempsey or, or Maxville or Warhope would be just so much more fulfilling for a family. I know what we have in terms of the access to sport and, and being able to get around and not spending all your life on a train or in gridlock. I think that we need to do more as a country sharing those population pressures. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to do it fairly. Yeah. But how, I know we, we all say, yeah, we all want more jobs and things like that. How, how does a state government actually produce more jobs or assist in producing more jobs? One of the things that um, I'm determined to achieve for this Shire is sewerage um, and wastewater connections for Repton and Marstrom, therefore Noko as well, Rally Industrial Estate and the growth areas of Yurunga. But I want of jobs and opportunities to go into that rally industrial estate and having proper um, wastewater management is part of that. So is supporting the Valor industrial land. Maxwell's nearly full in terms of industrial land. I mean, what we need to do is look at those companies um, that have come here in the past. Look at Planet Lighting, incredible international company employing really smart, creative people here in Bellow. Uh, look at those type of opportunities and move them out of Brisbane, move them out of, uh, of Sydney. That's what we need to do, take the pressure off those capital cities. But it's a tough job, but we've done it in the past. Akubra, Planet Lighting, we've got Karaka, we've got one of the last bus building um, businesses in Maxville, um, left in New South Wales. So we can do it well, just got to highlight it and 
show the opportunities to those Sydney businesses that they can have a happier, better, more loyal workforce in a regional area. So Rod, more people on the beach, maybe at Yurunga at you know, six or seven o'clock <laughs> in the morning, but there's plenty of room on that beach. Mm. I mean, it's beautiful. We are blessed. We mm. don't have to fill it to the gunnels. But I think some, some better equity of, of, of people and lifestyle and opportunity for the mm. regions and for the city work well together. Yeah. Um, one of the big issues gets talked about in town is uh, uh, sustainable, affordable living. Is there anything a state government can do uh, in regards to affordable living? I, I think um, there's some really good energy about that in Bellingen and, and they've met with me and we've spoken about potentially looking at Crown land um, areas. I think we should be involving the land councils in this. They've got some, some land and opportunities um, so that they can, they can be part of, of the future. I love the idea of you know, people not having to have a car mm. uh, and you know we're looking at better public transport we've got community transport there's lots of opportunities in the future car sharing um, I but think is, is there a way that um, uh, like once a developer gets involved with making housing it doesn't become as affordable is there a way that state government or council can be involved so they're actually using their land and and, and monitoring that so that it can become more affordable in that way, or does that not work? No, I think it can work. It can work if, you, if you're taking the cost of land out of a development, then it, it's going to come down in price, isn't it? So, mm. but there has to be safeguards. If I was going to, you know, employ someone to build a house for myself, I'm not going to go and ask council to build it. Mm. I'm going to ask a builder to build it. So yeah. it's a... It doesn't have to be one or the other. There can be arrangements, guidelines, contracts. Uh, you know, if, if a council or Crown Lands or state government is giving over land, then, you know, it can be written into the contract that there's a certain number of homes have to be for affordable housing in this range of a percentile of the average weekly wage or something. So, you know, we've done that in the past. Um, a question that I've always wanted to ask a politician if, um, if you are re-elected at the next election, but let's say um, uh, the coalition loses power, how does that work for you in an electorate where you're, you're no longer, you know, the, the, you know, you're not no longer working with the people in power? Is that a, is that a more difficult thing to work with the opposite, oh, with the new government, which is not your party, as far as funding goes and things like that? Um really important to understand that projects like the Bellingham Memorial Hall, the money's there, it's, it's contracted to that. We've got the you know, arrangements with council. Uh, that is a good example of something that will, will happen. But going back to your original questions about how you get on with the other side, um, I would be able to work with those on the other side um, and would continue to do that and make sure that that was the way I operated so we didn't become isolated if we didn't win government. Now, the, the Nationals have seven seats um, and you've, you've got a portfolio. That must put you pretty, pretty near the top with, within the National group. Um, does that mean there's a chance for you to become uh, leader of the Nationals at some stage in the future? Um, anything is possible if the opportunity presented itself. Melinda Pavey, thank you for joining me on Backchat. Thank you, Rob.